Um, so um, in this session now and the next one, I will talk about some fundamental principles for DHIS2 planning and also some tools that we have available that can help you to uh, plan and assess your DHIS2 projects. So first, I want to start us off with a small Menti exercise. You can open Menti and you can keep it up because there will be uh, another question at the end. So just keep, uh, just open your Menti, um, your Menti um, link with this code. Oh, the code again, sorry, sorry. <laughs> 4993-6401. Is the code. Everybody in? One moment, okay. It's early in the morning, so we have to switch on our computers and our brains. Okay, but some of us can get started. So the first question I have to you, we will talk about planning today. How do you plan your DHIS2 system? So the first question I have to you is, if you're planning a large dinner with your family and friends, you're going to invite a lot of people. Maybe in your country, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people, more than in Norway, but <laughs> you will do a huge dinner with your family and friends. What do you need to plan for? What do you need to think about for this to be a success? Okay, there are many good questions here. You have to think about the menu, uh, what diets people may follow, who you will invite, their culture, where they come from. Food preferences, place, variety, quantity, quality. Ambience, that's a good one. Suitable day. Who will pay? Very good one. Okay. Ah, oh, you had a lot of good ideas. Um, Involvement of all the stakeholders who are that, the husband and the wife and the everybody. Yeah, okay, good. No, this is great. Um, did anybody think about paying the electricity bill so you can cook your food? You just assume that's there, right? You, you just, you, you guess that the oven is working, yeah. And that you have some knives and some pots and some pans. I guess you just assume that's in place as well. Um, I see some of you here have uh, said that you need to know the preference of the people who are coming. So maybe there is some religious preferences. Some is vegetarian. Maybe some wants a kosher meal, not mixing milk and meat. I don't know. So there are many things to think about. So the purpose of this was just to think that it's not just what you will serve, but there are a million things to think about. Okay. Now the next question. So to plan a DHIS2 implementation, what do you need to think and plan for? You think. I will, of course, talk about it, but <laughs> what do you think you need to plan for? You need to know something about the user requirements. That's good. Indicators, infrastructure, well, that all stakeholders are on board, who to train resources and capacity, number of trainings, budgets, stakeholder identification and mapping, yep. Power, yeah, power. Information is power, data is power for sure. Or power or the electricity power, okay. Both, both the types of powers are important. <laughs> Internet, buy-in, coverage. Yeah, many good inputs here. Logistics, the central team. Okay, so I see here uh, who is the father of the work. Okay, so this is like who is owning it maybe or who is driving it. That's important.
Okay, great. A lot of good, uh, a lot of good uh, points here. How to bring the UIO team or HISP, the HISP team, uh, into the project. Great, thanks. So we will talk about many of these things uh, now today. So I will give a little bit of an introduction now in this first hour, and then many of these topics will be going into uh, depth later today and tomorrow, like more in detail. So I would just give high level intro and then um, myself and other colleagues will dive deep afterwards. So, um, I will talk about today uh, some key, key principles for planning, as I said, and then some evaluation and assessment uh, tools. So after this session, I want you to, to remember three things. So firstly, I want you to remember that uh, a health information system that we have been talking about this whole week is what we call a socio-technical system. Does that mean anything to you, a socio-technical system? Anyone? <laughs> No one? Yeah, it means something to you? Uh, uh, maybe it means um, the interaction and interconnection between the- Closer to the mic, I think, so people oh, can hear you. <laughs> uh, maybe it uh, means the interaction between the stakeholders and the community need or the yeah. diversity of the people who are working on design the system because you are talking about change management and behavior issue rather than data entry. Yeah. So it's a social process, maybe. That's a, that's a good point. So uh, an information system is not just uh, the technology. It's all the people around it that are using it, that are deciding that we should have it. It's the people entering the data, routines, uh, roles, incentives to report and use data, et cetera. So working with information systems like DHIS2, you need to think about the whole package. Secondly, uh, we need to build and plan for systems that will last for several years. So doing a DHIS2, um, um, now I'm going to use the word project, but then I say you should not use the word project. It's not a project. It's not something that starts in January and it ends in December. It's a very long-term continuous work. And the last one is to, as is the theme of this whole course or this academy, is to encourage integrated health information systems. So where possible, you should aim to share data, expertise, resources, et cetera. And there will be a very small quiz at the end. Just, yes, very, very, very small, not graded. Okay, so I will talk about some basic uh, principles of DHIS2 planning. So one of them is that, as I said, it's a long-term continuous process and you need to make sure that you plan for that. So this means that you should think about a gradual expansion of scope, like of users and of the data that you collect. You cannot maybe do everything at once. So it can be good to start a little bit small and then master that, make that work and then gradually expand. Maybe you include more facilities because you have more resources for infrastructure, or you add another data set or another program on board in your DHIS2 journey. Uh, so don't think that you will do everything at once. You can start small and build on it. But then again, not too small because you want to get some attention and some, some traction of your, of your DHIS2 uh, work. Uh, requirements are changing over time. So what is the right thing to do in year one might have changed in year three. So just make sure that you iterate and revisit your plans and your assumptions. Um, at DHIS2, we release uh, our software uh, at least yearly or twice a year. I'm looking at the back now. Uh, it's between one and tw two times a year, um, where there is lots of new functionality coming. So it's also good to revisit that and get the latest updates so you have the latest versions of DHIS2. It's not a static product. And another key uh, principle of planning your DHIS2 system is that a stable core system is based on a robust core design. So you do not want to add very fancy things on top of something that is not stable. And I will give some examples. Sometimes it can be quite attractive to plan for big advanced projects. And then we see sometimes that countries or organizations can forget the basic things underneath, like to pay the electricity bill or to buy knives and pots and pans if you're making the dinner. So um, make sure that you do that. 
and also to invest in what we call common building blocks that all programs using DHIS2 will benefit from. So invest in infrastructure, in skilled staff, connectivity, et cetera. And these are sometimes overlooked or invisible parts of your, of your DHIS2 um, uh, system, but nevertheless very important. So here is a house. Would you like to live in this house? Yeah. And what if the what if the owner of the house uh, is contracting you to build? They want a huge balcony on this house on the side. Like here. Here, they would like a big balcony on the side. Would you advise that? Maybe not the best idea. In reality, this is what happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe they just started with like one of the pallets at the bottom there to have something to sit on and then it grew. Yeah, who knows? So you can say that the system on top here, information system, maybe that wasn't the best, uh, the best uh, term, but it, it can be, for example, your one of your DHIS2 programs. And the stuff on the bottom, that's the invisible things that nobody wants to pay for. Nobody says, oh, I would really like to pay for one of these pallets at the bottom. But it's your job as managing these projects to say that we need someone to pay and work with these things that makes the house stable. So on the picture here, um, this is the framework that we use uh, in HISP now to uh, assess whether a, a country has a mature DHIS2 system. I'm not sure, is it readable from afar? If not, you can see it on Moodle. We say that we have some foundational pieces on the bottom. These are sort of equivalent to the poles that this house was standing on. These are things that it doesn't matter if you're collecting TB data or immunization data or individual data at each clinic. You need to take, think about and take care of these things. Uh, on the two top layers, we have aggregate systems. So aggregate HMIS data, aggregate TB data, aggregate EBI data, and the list could go on. We've just asked some questions for each of these and then tracker, which is individual level data. So we use this as a tool and I've linked in the Moodle, I've linked the tool, we call it our maturity profile. The tool is in the Moodle, so you can review that later. Um, so this is a list of questions that just gives you an indication of how is it really going with DHS2 security and compliance in country X? Is everything in place? Do they have the people, the tools and processes in place to handle uh, security, privacy, for example? Or are there room for improvements? So the point of showing this is that um, uh, we should really focus on these foundational pieces. I'll talk most about this today and in, in the rest of this course. Some of them will be separate sessions later. I put some arrows here. Let me just put the next slide so you can read better. So we will talk about leadership and governance uh, after this session. Um, we will talk about training end users or capacity building afterwards. We have something on security and compliance on the core team and on infrastructure later in the course. But really these are areas that needs to be focused on. So this was all part of building on the foundations, having a solid foundation before you expand. Another important principle is to have in-country teams to support national systems. We work with 50, 60 countries uh, through 70 countries through the HISP network. Sometimes we can experience that uh, somebody wants to sort of pay for something that is finished and ordered and just delivered to the door, like your finished bread. <laughs> like we would like a bread, <laughs> please give it to me. <laughs> Um, and from experience, that doesn't work very well. I mean, you have a very nice bread in day one, but then after a year, that bread is very moldy and doesn't is not so nice anymore. So um, we really, really advise that each country doing DHIS2 has a strong local team, a committed local team to work with DHIS2. And this local team must drive the process. They must be the owners and drive this process the whole way, and they must be involved in every step. So of course, new countries and also older DHS2 countries, they, they need help, technical assistance from, uh, from our network, the HISP network, and that is perfectly normal and okay. But we strive to always work in a way that 
uh, the people that are helping are working together with a team. So we try never to just sort of do the work and leave, but do the work next to somebody from the local team. So that next time you can do it by yourself. Another important thing is to plan for data use. There is, uh, I believe there is another session on designing for data use, isn't there, Shurajit, later? I'm not sure, sorry. Oh, it's from the triangulation, okay, fine, fine, yeah. So plan for data use. So whatever data is uh, that you plan to collect, I think we all, I also did the exercise on day one with the registers. I personally actually hadn't done that before. And it was very eye-opening, I think, for many of us. So thinking about whatever data that you decide to collect, what kind of decisions will be made on the basis of this data? There are a lot of nice to have data points, but can you do something about this data at some point in time? Can something be done differently if you know this, have this information? Sometimes it's interesting to know something about uh, every single patient, a lot of detail about every single patient, but will you as a health manager in this region, can you make any decisions and change how you run your health system based on that data? So these are just thoughts that needs to go through to enable that or to make sure that we reduce the, the data collection burden on people um, and make it simpler for everyone. Another principle here is to make DHS2 relevant for users. If uh, the people entering the data can feel that this is useful for them, can it perhaps save them time? Is it easier to make check if they have reported everything that they should report? Like give everybody in the chain some benefit and value. The value shouldn't just come to the person on top who has said that we need really good TB data in country X. Like it's also good for that TB nurse who is entering data to have some sort of benefit. So think through that in your projects. And also like DHS2 is part of the larger health system strengthening initiatives. Um, the plan, the DHS2 plan, it should be fully owned by the Ministry of Health and reflect their priorities. So as we say here, it's not the donor plan. It's not Gavi's plan. It's not CDC's plan. It's not UNICEF's plan, it's not WHO's plan, it's not the UIO plan or the HIS plan, it's the Ministry of Health plan. So a lot of people can come and say and tell countries, oh, you should do this, you should do that, we want this data, we want that data, but it really should be the Ministry of Health plan. Sometimes this means that uh, to get everybody on board in the ministry, you need to fast track certain activities and make everybody happy, so that's a bit of a trade-off, but make sure it's the ministry's plan. Another principle is to encourage what we call financial coordination. We want to try to align partners and the ministry, local governments, to align around one common DHIS2 plan. So it doesn't really matter if you have a TB program wanting TB data, you have the EPI program wanting EPI data. Try not to fund these in silos. So you have some money going to the EPI, some money going to the TB, some money going to this other program. If you can sort of bring people together around one DHS2 strengthening plan, that will be useful. So this picture here is from a, from a, a big park in uh, the city center in Oslo. If somebody has been there, the Frogne Parken, yeah, been in Oslo. So I really liked it. I thought it was like a good illustration of like having a lot of people carrying the same thing instead of everybody standing with their own garden hose and spraying each other down. So pooling of resources as well, if it's possible to use the same tablets in the same facility to report different data sets, quite often we see that you come to visit a facility and you see a health worker having four different tablets and you ask, what is this used for? Oh, this is for reporting the EPI data. This tablet is for reporting this. This tablet is for reporting that. This paper register is for reporting this. So if you as a ministry or as decision makers can try to pool resources together, you will save money and um, yeah. It reduces some fragmentation and it's, uh, if you're able to have a, a good plan, that one plan that many people can chip into, I think it's also easier to get things funded. 
we work, um, me and my colleagues, many of us, we work closely with actors such as Global Fund, Gavi, uh, for example, those uh, big ones, a lot closely with the um, uh, WHO. And we see that the better a country is at having and showing that we have one plan for DHS2, it's easier also for others to chip in and contribute towards that because it will benefit everybody. Hmm? Yes? Uh, point number four, please. I think if we are talking about the sustainable system with the HRC in the countries, we need to have the budget uh, as item from the government or MOH budget should be allocated for the HIS2. Yes. And the fund from the donors is the extra budget, but we have we need to have it as a national budget. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. It needs to be in your national budgets. Huh? Line item. It's a line item. Line item budget, data yeah. is expensive. Sometimes people think that data is just appearing out of the sky, but it's very expensive to train and equipment and everything. Yeah, very good point. It should be in the national budget. Yeah. But sometimes, uh, sometimes still external funding is coming in to strengthen. So I'm not saying that all the money is coming from outside, but yeah, yeah, good points. So when we do these maturity assessment exercises with countries, uh, we started this year using this framework, and I won't go, you can read the details in this Excel sheet that I, that I put in the, um, in the Moodle. Um, we've done it now in 40 plus countries, the his groups uh, around the world. So they have worked closely with ministries of health, sitting together with them, the IT department, Ministry of Health saying, okay, let's talk through your DHIS2 system and try to sort of score a little bit how things are going. Afterwards, they write a report where it starts with what is the ministry's objectives or priorities. So, for example, a Ministry of Health can say, oh, we, our main priority is to um, revise the HMIS tools. Uh, we want to scale uh, TB, individual level TB data to the whole country. Uh, and we want to do case-based surveillance, for example. And then based on the results that we have here, it's easier to give an opinion together with, uh, with the ministry team to say that, okay, this seems like a good idea. We would maybe wait a little bit before embarking on this project. Or if you want to do this, we advise that you do this first. So it's a tool to plan. Again, I think I talked about this, how to get this one plan funded. Um, we see that uh, there is quite a lot of interest around having this one plan concept that many people are buying into. World Bank, WHO, UNICEF all, have all expressed uh, interest, Gavi Global Fund. Uh, and of course, many countries here are very self-funded and have all the money over the government bud uh, budgets, as you say, so that's great. Uh, for those uh, countries that are more reliant on external funding from these big partners to have their health information systems running, um, uh, UIO and the HISP network, we have some technical assistance funding available through both Gavi and Global Fund. But we see that most of the money is coming through the country uh, technical assistance grants that are going to countries. And having these showing that you're planning holistically is also a way to influence that grant making process. Then I will spend a little bit of time uh, talking about audits and, uh, and assessments. So sometimes your plan looks like the top line there, like you want to go from A to B and you have your bike and everything is uh, fine and good to go and you made a plan how to get there, but the reality can be quite different. So first of all, it's, it's good to know, like, am I ready to start? Do I have everything in place to start? And then once you start your uh, journey, Stop at some points, eh? stop at some points along this uh, journey and see what actually happened now, where am I at now, what's ahead of me, and what should we plan for next. And we have some tools, um, we have some tools uh, within DHIS2 that we can help you to assess. It can be for uh, assessing uh, the quality of your implementation, your security setup, um, <laughs> if you have comments or questions, just uh, give them to me as I speak. That's fine. So this picture here, uh, this shows some different tools that we have to help assess you along the way. So the picture in the middle you have seen before now, this is what we call the DHIS2 maturity profile. 
if a country is using DHIS2, this can be a useful thing to revisit like at some regular intervals, maybe every second year or something, just to see where we're at. Um, we have more in-depth tools, as I said, metadata assessment that has to do with how clean or messy is your DHIS2 implementation. So that is uh, scripts that you can run on your system to ensure, am I collecting the same data element-wise? Am I collecting data that's not used in any indicator or dashboard, for example? Um, we have tools for mapping capacity needs and training plans. So different things we can advise on. And then we also have a tool that we've called the DHS2 readiness assessment that might be relevant for some of you who have not yet started with DHS2, which is a set of questions that can help highlight some uh, uh, gaps or things you need to think about before you get started. So we are based at a university. University of Oslo is where this whole um, organization or network originated from. So we also have uh, a lot of focus on research. We educate a lot of PhD students, master's students, and we conduct research. So it's also possible to dive deeper into your implementation to really understand a specific phenomena together with students and, and academics. The last thing I will mention is that we have um, in many countries now during COVID, and I guess the same is for most of you sitting here, uh, there have been quite big investments in information systems the past three years. Suddenly everybody understood that data is important, maybe more than they understood before. Oh, we need to make sure people are vaccinated because they cannot travel, for example. So this might be a good point in time to try to leverage some of these investments. So, for example, a lot of countries have done COVID surveillance. Now is maybe the time to work again getting the COVID surveillance and strengthen routine surveillance systems. Many people have worked on COVID vaccination. This is a good opportunity to strengthen routine immunization uh, programs. Yeah. We also see that there has been big uh, investments into infrastructure in countries. A lot of new tablets, computers, uh, access points, et cetera, have been invested in. So also try to leverage that. If the equipment is there, can you use it for something different than COVID? Yes. See something related yes. to COVID-19. Yes. Uh, as the supervisor of the COVID surveillance in Palestine during the pandemic, mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges we had, the data entry from all the users, they are suffering because they need to search for the case and the data entry for the lab and for the, the investigation form for the uh, management done for the patient after it's uh, been positive. I think we need to think how we can enter the data in such a situation. Mm. It's a difficult. Uh... Yeah, it's a difficult. So we worked with a lot of countries during COVID supporting with surveillance and vaccination. I think overall we can see that we have not seen one country really except some small island states that have managed to keep up with COVID vaccination data in particular. It's been very difficult to have this very high load of data entry happening real time across many different sites when you're in a rush. So um, I think we have all learned a lot from that, both on, for example, we talked about performance on day one. Is the system, does it have good performance? Somebody asked that question. We solved some performance issues during that time. But I think also a lot of countries have learned what it takes to enter real-time data for every single patient. So we are quite hesitant. I work a lot with countries uh, together with Gavi on uh, immunization, for example. Many countries, they want to do immunization tracker, tracking every child. So Rwanda has done it, but it's very challenging. <laughs> it's, uh, it's impressive what Rwanda has done, but it takes a lot of effort to have every, because you need like from the infrastructure, you need a device and a tablet available at every site. And that tablet has to work when the patient is there not next week, because then you have a huge backlog. So for COVID, for example, we have seen uh, examples of, um, to keep up with data entry, there have been countries that have um, used the army to enter data. They just deployed a huge battalion of the army to sit down and punch vaccination data. There have been examples of uh, volunteers entering data. Also, when I got to get my vaccination in, in Norway, you can say, oh, they are far ahead with digitalization, everything. 
but at every vaccination point, there was one person giving the shot and one, and one person entering the data. So what country has that kind of resources for routine immunization? No one, or very few, I would guess. So these are things that you need to think about when you're planning your, your projects. Be it DHIS2 or another software, it doesn't, it does, doesn't have anything to do with DHIS2. It's any information system, but plan what kind of resources you have. Okay, mini quiz time Ment on Menti. Okay, one quick question or comment from Shambhu. Yeah, it's just um, it's uh, one just to talk about uh, what my colleague was talking about. One of the ways um, I have said that maybe was somewhat efficient when it was uh, during the pandemic. Hmm. Um, we had um, a huge um, workload at the airport and we decided to have uh, a kind of self-registration. So you understand that uh, not everyone in our population is able to have that kind of skills for self-registration, but at least that part of population which is able to self to get self-registered, yeah. they were using that option of self-registration and at the vaccination of testing site it was just to use the unique ID and add the results. But the registration of profile was being done by themselves using the option of self-registration. Yeah. So where it's possible, they can adopt that uh, uh, that uh, that part of self-registration mm -hmm. configuration. I think that's yeah. a very that's a very good point. And and we'll talk more about that. I think the session is tomorrow. Um when you're when you're starting a digital project like this, is uh, the, the maybe the easiest thing is to just put. We have a Norwegian expression. I'm not sure if it's in English, but to power, to put power to paper. So you have your paper form, and then you just make it into a digital form. But everything stays the same. It's the same people entering the data. The data flow is exactly the same. But doing things, digitizing or digitalizing. Um, a data flow or a system, it gives you opportunities to think new. Like maybe it's not that person who needs to enter that data. Maybe the people can do it themselves on their phone and then submits and it can be picked from somewhere. So it's a good opportunity to think new. Okay, so uh, mini quiz time on Menti. How do I go to the next one? Can you name some key principles of DHIS2 planning now? Did you learn anything from what I was talking about? <laughs> it doesn't have to be word by word, but what did you learn from the session? What will you think about when you're planning your DHS to, to um, implementations? Okay, great. Look, it looked like uh, my message was going through. That's good. Very good. The next uh, session that we have, uh, I think we have another other half an hour or so, uh, is on governance. Um, Olav, your name is also up there, but I can speak. But if you want to join, your uh, yeah, thumbs up. <laughs> I see that you're busy in the back there. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Okay, but I think that you really, uh, you really got many of the key points. Readiness, are you ready to do what your plan is? Data use, MOH involvement, budgeting, ownership. That's great. Okay, I think uh, seeing that we started a bit late, I will just uh, run straight into the governance session. So we also have time to have tea and cakes, which is wonderful in this hotel. I will move straight to the session here called governance. Just give me a second.
Okay. So I will now talk a little bit about governance in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So first of all, I want to, I think I'll just jump straight to, um, to um, the Menti actually, new Menti, new Menti code, 6227668A2. You're getting good at Menti now, so this is easy. Okay, I will start by this question. 6227-6682. Can you see, should I find the big number again or it's okay? 6227-6682. Okay, so here I'm wondering because governance is one of those very fluffy words that can mean nothing and everything to people. So I want to understand what does this word mean to you? When you hear governance, what is it? What are you thinking about when you hear governance in the in the in the, in, the, in connection to uh, information or health information systems? Policies and procedures, leadership, ownership, accountability, political will, those who will make sure the system needs requirement implementation is on track, connecting all, strategic planning, yes, policy makers. Clear roles and responsibilities. Make roles, yeah. Coordination of digital activities by providing leadership. Many good answers here. Okay, I think we're, we're talking about the same thing, which is good. <laughs> Always good to check before you start. that things are done in a legal fashion, rules and norms that shape roles and responsibilities, incentives, tools and processes. Yeah, many very good answers here. <laughs> 